Good day chaps. So today's video is a quick one covering the experimental Heavy Cromwell. This project began back in 1943 with the aim to up armour the Cromwell tank then still in development and give it a higher chance of survival on the battlefield when it did enter production. The Cromwell itself was the subject of much controversy at this time and it was a major focusing point in the Great Tank Scandal publication in 1943. No, not that one, the original one. It's certainly not unfair to say that at the top end of British tank design, both politically and from a leadership side, it was a bit of a dog's dinner, with constant changes of who was involved and appointments of men that had no background in the subject, or were appointed based on political connections over any capability. And while there were good apples amongst the bad, these had often had their voices drowned out or were simply ignored until well beyond the point that it would have been relevant. And it's these decisions, or lack of them, that affected everything from what engine, armour, firepower and how the tanks would be made. The development of Cromwell fell well and truly into this remit. The vehicle had been proposed in 1940 at its earlier stages, and certainly by July 1941, the government had been informed of a new tank, described as a tank that would surpass in armour, armament and power anything we've so far produced. And while this might sound a little bold, it wasn't too far off. Certainly by 1941 it was superior to any German tank, and even by mid-1942 when it was planned to go into service it was very competitive to the Panzer IV F2 having marginally better armour, a gun that was capable for the time, and a far greater turn of speed and better overall profile. And yet the Cromwell did not see action until 1944, by which point, other than its good mobility, it was relatively undergunned, and in terms of anti-tank capability, was a step backwards, although it did have a more useful high explosive round. The armour for 1944 was also somewhat lacklustre, and while the protection was improved on some later models to be the equal of its German counter, it wasn't really until the Comet and the post-war Centurion that the status quo closed to an appreciable equivalence. A similar story could be said for the Sherman, however that was at least balanced by its adaptability and its vast production capability, and the Americans were much more cohesive on the whole to getting their shit sorted out than the British. That's not to say that the Cromwell is a bad tank, it's not, but it certainly had its fair share of flaws by the time it saw action, and these were issues that could have been addressed much, much sooner. But the British were also in a difficult position, having learned a lesson the hard way about rushing tanks off the drawing board, notably with vehicles like the Churchill, which had arguably the lowest reliability at the outset, being in some cases down to just 50 miles before a complete overhaul, and the Crusader, which vanished very quickly post-Africa and for very good reasons. Lessons had been learned in this time frame, and now vehicles were to be fully run in, tested, and any teething issues ideally rooted out, which led to longer delays and thus you get a double-edged sword. You have troops calling for better vehicles and ministers arguing on the sake of the fallen soldiers, while on the other side they're determined to try and put a tank into service that might actually work. Cromwell fell very much into this latter category, but ongoing problems such as what engine stymied this, with Lord Nuffield being particularly belligerent in wanting the woefully outdated Liberty engines, Leylands being unable to make up their minds switching from one to the other, and then later back again, while only Birmingham Motor and Carriage Works were focused on a sound working platform. Meanwhile, three years of debates raged on whether they should be welded or riveted, which led to outbursts of violence and letters between senior officers threatening to smash each other's faces in. Handbags were being swung, tea was being spilt in the streets and the biscuits were being trodden into the Axminster and all of this was actually delaying anything useful being done. During this development hell however, there were those that saw that even by 1943 changes would be needed. These were split into roughly several areas, engines, suspension, tracks, guns and so on but today we're going to look at the requirements for the armour improvements and this primarily came into two areas how it was made and attempts to up armour the tank. The idea to make the Cromwell tank out of welded plate had been one issue 
And although some of these were later done, notably the Mark V and VII, it had in fact been tested out on the Cromwell Mark I and the Centaur, with working pilots of both made in 1941. The second attempt was to up-armour the vehicle. This was carried out by Rolls-Royce in mid-1943 to bring the weight up to 29 tonnes and it had an armour layout increasing the hull to 101mm or 4 inches on a Cromwell D hull fitted with a 6 pounder gun. The initial armour had to be between 1 to 1.5 inch welded plates over the turret front, visor plate and nose. This brought the turret up from 76mm IT-80 steel to 101mm on the turret front. The turret itself now being of a single plate rather than the regular dual layer type. The hull front, which was normally 64mm, was up by an inch to 89mm on the far left and 101mm over the remaining two thirds of the visor, and the nose from 57 to 82.4mm with an angle of 20 degrees for an 87mm lower nose plate. These plates were made by Sheffield Steel, likely ESC, and tested at trial X489 on the 21st of June 1943 at the Middlewood Gun Range, Mosin Lane, Worrell and Sheffield, albeit as loose plates on a steel mock-up nose only. These tests were done with a 6 pound at around immunity levels and the armour held up very well, preventing what would have otherwise have been perforations. The only main issue being that any hits to the sides could cause edging effects which would break the welds, so recommendations were made to increase the thickness or number of welds. Trials were next carried out at Long Valley Test Track in Aldershot somewhere before the 1st of September 1943, with the vehicle coming in at 29 tonnes, or about one tonne over the standard vehicle. However, they already had ballast tested another vehicle up to 31 tonnes and so they were fairly confident in most aspects. 174 miles of road running and 110 miles of cross country were done with speeds of up to 25 miles per hour or 40 kilometers per hour recorded at cross country speeds. The only differences recorded which are not seen in the photographs and which may have been taken before or after these trials are the inclusion of large spring canister and S600 shock absorbers to the standard arms rather than the first and second only. Overall, the vehicle passed its tests. No major issues automotively were found. The suspension was adequate, although two road wheels were found to be out by about one-sixth of an inch at the end of the runs, and it was noted that these could simply be strengthened, and that there was some concern if brake fade would occur, but none was found. After the trials, it was recorded that the vehicle seemed to perform well with the applique armour, and the inspectorate team recommended this for all future service Cromwells. When the vehicle did find enter service, however, many didn't have any of this, having only the standard hulls. And although later, as mentioned, some welded Cromwells did come into service with increased armour, most of them came with the stock armour. The sad aspect of this was that although they had demonstrated that Cromwell could easily be up armoured with little or no detriment, they weren't and other changes taking place in enemy tank and allied ones were not applied when they could have been. However, with that being said, cooler heads were obviously at work, as Comet also begins its design in 1943, and so clearly there were those who saw that the new and yet untried British tank would need to be quickly replaced, entering service just five months after Cromwell, and lasting until the late 1950s, while Cromwell itself was more or less placed into second line service just one year after it finally entered service with the British. And finally to the usual questions of could this be in games? Well yes, very easily, given that it's got the same speed as the Cromwell, although the ground resistance will be tweaked a little bit by that extra tonne and so on. The gun is the six pounder, so better penetration and slightly worse alpha. And of course you've got the chunkier armour, so an absolute ideal vehicle for war thunder in the Cromwell tree, or as an overpriced Soviet premium loot box in World of Tanks, the usual stuff. But let me know where you think it could fit. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed that quick ramble on this vehicle. It does crop up from time to time, and often mistakenly called Cromwell 2 or Churchill Turret on a Cromwell and all that bullshit, none of it's true. We have a video on Cromwell 2 if that's your cup of tea. Any other questions, let me know below, and until next time, toodle pip.